once again to Martial Secrets, where we seek out the most interesting and skilled martial artists to share their insights and years of training with you, the listener. I'm your host, Chris Wilder, and on this broadcast, Steve Barnes. Steve Barnes is a martial artist of some 30 years. He studied and earned Don ranking in karate and judo. He has studied the Indonesian art of pinchak salat and yoga as well. An accomplished best-selling author of science fiction, Steve Barnes also has television in his background, having written for The Twilight Zone, Outer Limits, Andromeda, Stargate, and Baywatch. <laughs> Steve, Steve Barnes also has a few opinions uh, on self-improvement, and he helps others reach their potential through his programs, such as The Five-Minute Miracle. Uh, always full of ideas and never boring, Steve Barnes, welcome to Marshall Secrets. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Chris. I, 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 you can't They'll wait. never let me forget Baywatch. <laughs> no, no, and you, you did more than one, didn't you? I did four of them, actually. Actually, I choreographed a fight scene on one of those episodes. That was kind of fun. Wow, and Mitch won, right? Actually, it was between it was between a female lifeguard and a, a female terrorist who had kidnapped her. <laughs> oh, that that happens on the beach there so often. I'm glad you were able to help. Indeed. <laughs> Uh, most of our listeners, Steve, have uh, some level of familiarity with karate and judo, but, but what's Pinchak Salat? Can you give it's, us an overview of that? It's an Indonesian martial art. I mean, just like if you talk about Kung Fu or something of that nature, it's, it's, it's a term that has to do with, with fighting per se, and there are a bunch of different styles under that particular umbrella. The particular style that I practice, Sarah, uh, comes out of the de Tours family, Paul de Tours, Maurice de Tours, Victor de Tours. And there are a lot of ways in which it resembles a grappling art that works in stand-up range. Um, and so it's, it's really interesting. It's extremely intensive in terms of the way the principles are applied. So it, I found that it's, it's been very good to help me actually understand my karate and judo better. Are these the guys that put the... Um... I, I don't know, it almost looks like a hopscotch pattern on the floor of their training facility. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, in, in some ways, there's, there are patterns to move to, to step to. Other ways, there are patterns where you understand the disruption of your opponent's balance in terms of, so they're like visual, visualizing Kazushi in, in certain ways. Uh, but in, in, instead of pulling your opponent off balance, it's more like uh, what direction do, if I were to strike an opponent, what would be the vector that I would strike him along, not just to hurt his body, but to disrupt his balance? Hmm. That, that, that's, uh, that is um, first and secondary, clearly. There's uh, two things going on there at one time. Yeah. Um, weapons? They have, uh, yeah, knives, uh, knives, sticks, things of that sort, swords and so forth. But the most important weapons would be knives, but the knife technique is, uh, is actually, a lot of the empty hand technique is actually knife technique, just with the knife removed. Uh, and they, they go back to that later on. Um, in that sense, it has a lot of similarity to Kali or Eskrima. Yeah, where, the, um, where the, the, the knuckles on your hand actually indicate where the cutting Blade is, is oh, knuckles or or the blade blade edge of the hand or reinforced finger strikes to to vital points organ points uh, you know various meridians and so forth and so on uh, a lot of that I mean like with most martial arts there are aspects of it that are kind of external you know here is just a general you know twist that you do or a general strike that you do and then later on you're given greater uh, refinements where you understand that this strike happens along the curve of the occipital and you, you, you curve the fingers around to catch, the, to catch the undifferentiated nerve endings at the hinge of the jaw, but just below the ear and so forth, to, you know, to produce this effect and that effect. So there are always elements of, there are always refinements on top of refinements, and that, that kind of keeps it interesting. When was the moment, or, or what was the moment that got you involved in the martial artists where you just went, you know, ba-bang, that's what I, that's, I want to do that. Well, I think that the there was a particular moment in my life where I had been getting the, the living snot beaten out of me, and I just I remember walking out. These, these guys were like following me home and beating me up, and I walked out into the middle of the street um, and stood on the double yellow line. I was like 12 years old at the time, and uh, trucks and cars whizzing past me on both sides. And I told this guy, I said, "You know, come out here and do that." I was going to kill him. I was going to push him in front of a truck. And I realized at that moment that I was, I'd rather die 
then continue to be dishonored in that fashion. And then it was just a matter of trying to find the right the right route, the right way, the right techniques. I was just dealing with with so much emotional pain in that sense. So it, it definitely was not out of it was not primarily out of a sense of joy or self expression. It was it, it was not even a matter of physical threat in the sense of thinking I was going to be killed physically. It was more a matter of I could feel my my ego crumbling. I could feel my sense of self dying. Um, I was just so much of an outsider at that point in my life, and I just I couldn't handle anymore. What did you do? Go to Yellow Pages, or did you walk by a storefront? Uh, no, it, it took it took years. I mean, I my first martial arts experience actually was I studied a little. There was a Shotokan club in my high school. I did that a little teeny bit, um, and then after that, when I was in in junior college, I did some wrestling, and then after that, um, I did a little bit of just I. I kind of bummed around and did a little bit at this school and a little bit at that school, not much of anything. Got to college, and there was a guy who did some taekwondo named Pham Tai Tu, and he started a, t- a taekwondo club at, at, at college, and I, I liked that. But it wasn't until uh, I saw, I went to the uh, L.A. Sports Arena, and it was a big martial arts expo, and I saw a Kimpo Karate demonstration with a guy named Steve Sanders, who was at that time and to this date the fastest human being I've ever seen in my life. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's a piece of work insanely fast um and i said i want that um and that was the moment at which something just kind of turned on in my head and to this date uh although i did not uh, get my don ranking under steve um i i consider him to be one of the three most important men in terms of forming my personality as a human being talk about steve sanders for a moment um to some people he might uh yeah, you know, he he might be kind of a, a, an enigma. I mean, although he's he's been in a couple movies and he's you know clearly won some tournaments and so forth, and he's a superb martial artist. You know, he's not out there uh, on a self promotion circuit very much, so he kind of flies underneath the radar. No, um, Ed Parker, the guy who. About him? But Ed Parker, the man who brought uh, the Kempo Karate system uh, over from Hawaii, once told me that of all of his students, Steve, Steve Sanders performed Kempo the closest to the way he believed that it should be performed. He was uh, a, a martial arts, he still is, he, he's a martial arts instructor in the inner city in Los Angeles um, of insane speed. Bruce Lee once said that, uh, well, basically he had the fastest hands that, that he'd ever seen. Um, he grew up. He, he came up to the to the tournament scene at that during that era. He was international champion at the internationals in, in Long Beach many times, and in in won championships all over the all over the country. But he he was a true. He still is a, a true warrior in the sense that uh, he never was into the martial arts for the money of it. He would actually work another job in order to keep his martial arts school open, and um, students who were running with gangs, he would let train at the school for free if they would stop running with their gangs. He'd say, you know, if you want to be, you know, remember, you want to belong to a gang, be in the toughest gang in town. At one period of time, seven out of ten of the top karate competitors in the California, Nevada, Arizona, tri-state area were all this one man's students. He He's astounding and just a wonderful human being, as well as an incredible technician with incredible amount of street fighting experience. Uh, and even in his 60s, he still work, does work as Wesley Snipes' bodyguard. If a fascinating uh, um, positive footprint. Uh, Very much so. Yeah. Um, when you look at, um, at your, your karate, your judo, uh, these are different things. You're, you're so off. These are different things. Did you learn different things from each one of these arts? Well, uh, sure. I mean, you know, um, my Don ranking in, in karate came first, and that's you know, a matter of, of creating physical force and conveying it to a target while denying target to, to the opponent primarily. And you, there are various things that you do to your physiology to focus that energy, you know, using pressure and impulse and other principles like that. You know, whereas judo is, is primarily a matter of, of leverage, you know, knowing where your body is and where your center of mass is and how that person's body reacts when you push it or pull it and this way or that. Jiu-jitsu, which, which I have a, a brown belt in Shurinju Jiu-jitsu, is an interesting meld of those things in the sense that it, it was it was using punches and kicks to set you 